Hello, Gary. Hello, Guy. God, we've been a while, hasn't it? It has been a while. It's been so nice to just, well, just to not have to see you. I forced myself on you a couple of times, didn't I? I actually came to your house. You did come to my house. Uh, uh, yes, uh, it was, you, um, uh, said, we're still burning sage. Now, um, <laughs> but uh, and uh, and I came to your house, of course, for, over Christmas. For, yeah, um, my, my yeah, annual party, Christmas do. Do you know? I have to say, we, I, I'll say this now. I speaking to Mister Townsend at my party, who said, "Do you know what the thing is with Guy?" He said, "You think you've got the bass nailed on your demo, and then Guy comes in and the bass goes up another notch and another Aww. notch." Because you played, you played with him, didn't you? Not that I did not play that with him. It's very sweet. And it, actually, at your party, he said a very lovely thing to me. He said, "I did actually avoid working with you for years because you're just too much of a fan." <laughs> well, that's true, and I think that's yeah. probably why he's not on this show. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. He keeps he keeps knocking us back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and of course, you've you've actually played a bit with David Gilmore. I saw that on Instagram. Yes, uh, I was. Yeah, I can talk about this because thanks to Polly's Instagram feed. Yeah, I did a week working with David with Steve Gadd on drums. Amazing. Um, How was that? Can I just say, Steve Gadd's bass drum just makes me want to cry. Really? It's just, yeah, it's just something about the way he puts it. And where did you, did it. you sit with it perfectly? Oh, uh, I like to think so. How fabulous. So we've got all that to look forward to this year as well. And so, some more we music. Have. But, but hey, what a guest today. Yeah, Tony James. Honestly, I mean, Generation X was such an inspiration, and I'll gas on about it later on when he's on. Such an inspiration to to what we, to Spandau Ballet, to be honest. I mean, when we were the makers initially, and then later on in 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 art design and just pop sensibility. I love Tony, but his story is quite long, isn't it? I mean, he's been it around. Is, yeah, a lot, but also because he is one of those great conceptualists. He's one, you know, he's very much the he's he's. He's not someone I think about as a bass player. He's just one of those people who's a linchpin yeah. of great ideas-based projects. Yeah, yeah. So he's right at the beginning of a punk with London SS, then Generation X, and, and then later on, of course, Zig Zig Sputnik, and he plays with Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers, Sisters of Mercy he played with for a while. Right, and yeah. now, of course, it's Generation Sex, which are enormous. Let's get him on. Welcome to The Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. But it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I'm sitting in the back of the car coming into London. They're brilliant. That caused a big problem in the band, actually. I was having too much fun. Thank you guys for still being around, still making music, still being into it, and doing this podcast. It, it's uh, it's fabulous. Well, I get the feeling that us three should go for a pint. That's what I think. I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah. Two, two, get good yeah. at something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Keep on rocking! Hello, Tony. Um, I haven't seen Hello, you for guy. years. We used to uh, we used to hang in the Groucho with Emma. Exactly. With Emma when you were Kamen a young man, just about to get married. Oh, good <laughs> lord! Wow. <laughs> I think you, you you were with uh, Janet Street Porter at the time, probably weren't you? Tony? Probably yes. Now let me just get a bit more volume. Okay, I have to get into character. Uh, uh, Tony, it was great to see you. I saw you for breakfast uh, the other week, yeah. and, and this is how this came about because uh, we hadn't seen each other for a while. That's uh, right. Well. I, know. I mean, I, I, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to say you're now 70. Yes. What is amazing is your life has, has sort of been directing itself just to this past couple of years. Because these couple of years, you're suddenly on private jets being flown around doing rock shows <laughs> bigger than you've ever played before. And, sure. and, and it's it suddenly happened. That was a long it's, gestation. Isn't it? It's strange, isn't it? The fact that me and Billy and Steve and Paul have all known each other for so many years and that we even grew up in the same neighbourhood. You know, Steve Jones and I were born in the same hospital in Shepherd's wow. Bush oh. uh, and we all grew up in the same kind of terraced houses, toilet at the bottom of the garden, not to big up my credentials as <laughs> Look how poor we were. Oh, hang on. Like... Well, sorry, we'll talk about Tony Parsons and the orange juice later. But... <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> that was cruel. <laughs> so, it, you know, it, we've known each other all this time. So it was an extraordinary thing to play with Generation Sex and to go out and play those great songs last year. Um, you know, we had such a great time. Such fun for me to play the Pistol songs that I knew and had oh, grown yeah. up with as well. 
<laughs> so it was an amazing thing. Who's and yes, I can say after this whole arc of the story to be doing better now than we've ever done yeah. in our career is a great time. I'm glad it's now, not it was then. <laughs> yeah, or, I'm or in 10 years' time. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> we will be in trouble then. Generation eighty, but what, how did it? Whose idea was Generation Six? Um, Billy had we'd. In fact, my, no. Let me think. My wife had said she wanted to go to um, America, and and we decided to rent an, a, a house on the beach in Malibu. This is in twenty eighteen. Um, and we went out, and part of the reason was to hook up with Billy and to talk about they were re-releasing some of the old Generation X product. And um, and we'd always talked about getting back together again as Generation X, as the original band. So we met up at um, Chateau Marmont one day, and Billy and I, you know, it was as if, we, like I'm sure you find it with your bandmates, as if you've never been away. Um, and, <laughs> if you've uh, never left court. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> See, you got all the funny lines. <laughs> so um, Billy said, um, what are you doing on, you know, tomorrow? Because uh, do you want to go and see you too with me? And I said, yeah, not thinking how long it takes to get from Malibu to Beverly Hills back to where you two were playing. This is like a four hour round trip. Everything in LA is, yeah. <laughs> Forget how long everything yeah, takes. Yeah. Anyway, we've we finally arrive at, at um, the U2 gig and we go through uh, more and more security getting from the big backstage area to the VIP area to the VVIP area. And we finally burst into a tiny room, which is about as big as my living room. And the first person I see is Brad Pitt. And then I see Steve Jones standing there who comes up, gives me a giant bear hug. And he went, you know what, Tone? If you do Generation X, use me as a guitarist. And I sort of went, and I looked at Billy, and I turned around, and Steve had vanished. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was as if he like kind of said, "Why don't we do this?" Because you know what it's like when when you're you're doing things with groups. No one wants to kind of lose face or be the one who actually says, "What about doing this?" In case the other person goes, "Oh fuck off! Don't be ridiculous." You know, so it's almost like Steve kind of blurted out the unsayable because obviously back in the day when we recorded Dance With Myself, we did it with Steve Jones. He was right, the guitar yeah. Yeah. on that record. So there was a kind of a history and a precedent. Because didn't Steve then sort of, it, it was sort of announced when you and Billy went on Jones's jukebox. That's right. So he texted me the next day and went, why don't you and Billy come on the show? And we met in the green room for about, two minutes before we went live on the air and steve went so why don't we do this and he went i'll give cookie a ring and billy went yeah it'd be great so we went on the air and it was kind of a done deal <laughs> where there was no real discussion but it's one of those moments where you think it's meant to be who came up with the name the idea steve said oh i think we should call it generation sex you know, otherwise it would have been, what else was it? X pistols, you know, the sex X. <laughs> pistols. Yeah. So generation sex, you know, sounded good because it sort of rolls off the tongue and, you know, looks makes looks great on merchandise. So, um, so did you get into rehearsals in L.A. or what, what happened? And how what did we do the set list? We, we said, let's all do it. And then um, it, it took like a, a, a while, maybe a, a year or so to kind of get it together and and we Paul and I flew out to Los Angeles and we rehearsed for a week in Los Angeles and then we did one kind of secret show that they just announced on the radio uh, uh, perfectly at the club called the Roxy Club uh. in LA and we did one show just to see how it would go and and see if it worked and of course it was so great and we were all dying to do it and we were set to tour almost straight away. Uh, but then Steve had some problems with his heart that's been widely uh, talked about. So we had to kind of put it back for a couple of years. So anyway, next last year, we finally got it together. And uh, Steve flew over and we rehearsed in Sh Shepherd's Bush, very fitting, where we were all born. Where, um, where in Shepherd's Bush, out of interest? That one under the arches. Where oh, the crack my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, where the crack dealers live. <laughs> it's really, there was us and Metallica were rehearsing in the studio next door. 
even though ours was bigger, I have to say. Um, <laughs> and how was everyone's chops? Great. I mean, it's just, you know, Steve sort of gets up and he plugs in and it sounds like Steve Jones. It's just great. And Billy had learned all his parts. Paul and I were totally no perfect because we both I rehearsed loads and loads at home to make sure I knew. Because also it was really hard to um, learn to play that fast again. You forgot how fast the Generation X stuff was. The pistol stuff is all quite mid pace. I remember uh, an interview with you years and years and years ago. Sorry to interrupt, but you saying how shocked you were when you first heard the Pistols records Is it because how slow they were. That's right. Because everyone was doing this Ramones thing. And then you, I remember, because your quote was great. You said, and suddenly they come out and they're like, who speed? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're like small faces speed. Yeah. That was what it was. And uh, so playing their stuff for me is is easy. But I tell you what, it's when we when you plug in and Steve and Paul play and yeah. Billy singing, it just sounds massive because Steve has that sound. Yeah, you, you, uh, you told me this the other day, which I didn't know. This is a bass player thing, Guy. But do you know, I mean, obviously, Tony plays with, with a pick. So, I yeah. mean, Glenn doesn't. But Tony ever plays upstrokes. Upstrokes. I did know that. Yeah. And it's... The, much harder. I don't know why. So much um, harder. So much harder. What the hell are you thinking? I know. Well, I must have and started... And a Rickenbacker. You play a Rickenbacker, right? I mean... Yes. I must have God. started when I was at school. Um, practicing in my bedroom um, on a little bass guitar that I'd actually made at the time. Um, and I must have just started playing all upstrokes. You know, you didn't have YouTube then. You had a bit of Top of the Pops, but <laughs> I had no idea that I was doing it wrong. But wow. as it turns out, you, you get a better sound by pulling upstrokes because you're pulling those strings towards you. So well, you get yeah. a much more... Yeah, Thumping, I mean, it does make sense. Yeah. Down. Yeah, totally, but like you said, you had nothing. This lot, um, they all had, they all had play in a day. We yes. had, we didn't even have that. Right. Tony, yes. did, did you have trouble masturbating as well? <laughs> <laughs> no, he was very, very good at it. I think we'll only probably. upstrokes. This isn't going to work, surely. I thought I'd broken it the first time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who decided you weren't going to do uh, Anarchy in the UK though? Uh, I think. Billy, Billy, all of us felt uncomfortable because it's so John's song and, and so his whole persona. It seemed not right for us to do it. When we first did the gigs, we mainly did material off the Swindle record. Um, oh. And we did the Ronnie Biggs track, you know, which this time right. we did. Friggin' in the rigging and all that. No, we didn't do that one. <laughs> <laughs> but this time we decided, you know, we can't consciously get behind the lyric of that song you know, at our age. But then we gradually introduced uh, the more obvious Pistols classics like Bodies and uh, we're going to do Holidays in the Sun as well now. So, uh, you know, the, all the really great ones. Uh, how great is it to come on and open with Pretty Vacant? It, if you're a football team, you're 2-0 you're up before you even walk on the pitch. Is it a bit uncomfortable singing Holidays in the Sun, though? You know, in those days, in the 70s, you know, people... You know, in the crowd wearing swastikas as well. It's, it's all, we're living in different times now. It's totally different now. You don't get any of that stuff. Oh, no, I don't you mean know. that. I just mean the lyrics of Holiday. Yeah, yeah. yeah the ly yes, might be a little It'll on be. point for now. I don't know. I mean, well, we did yeah. make an adjustment of some of the lyrics right. of tracks that made them more appropriate for now. You know, well, stuff that we felt uncomfortable singing now. Yeah. Often, don't you find that, you know, stuff you wrote when you were 18, 20, you have this whole different view of the world. And now perhaps we're a little bit more sophisticated or a little bit more conscious of people listening to those words. So, yeah. Well, you know, punk lyrics were very much about youth, weren't they? I mean, you know, it's a bit yeah. like The Who singing My Generation. They still manage that. And you guys singing your generation. I guess that works, sure. though, doesn't it? Your generation. Yeah, because it's such a the whole thing about all those songs is they're great tunes. Great tunes. Do you do it's not a, kiss me deadly? I mean. If oh, it was kiss me deadly, all that I, I love yeah, that stuff. Exactly but, doing those ones. And, and what about Billy's solo stuff? Do you do any of that? We we just we made a conscious decision not to do any of our solo stuff. I actually learned a load of Billy's tracks as well, just in case, and in sometimes in the sound check we just chuck stuff in. But it was, it's really just to say here, here is a combination of these two great groups, two great dynasties, 
and we play the sort of greatest hits of both. So it, I think it would muddy the water if we started throwing in Love Missile or White Wedding or, you know, yeah. joint professionals or whatever. You could do The temptation is there because they're all such winners. Yeah. Um, but then you need, you need more it. of a palette, don't you? I mean, especially if you're doing Seek Seek stuff, then you need to get into That's right. sequences. So, you know, and... Love Missile F111 is exactly the same speed as um, Dance With Myself. And in fact, when we used to do the Zig Zig gigs, we used to go into Dancing With Myself at the end of Love Missile. Oh, amazing. Because <laughs> so, they're both at 192 BPM, so they fit together perfectly, and they're both in the same key. How they're both not, how very it. Notting Hill. Yes, they yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for, for those who don't know, there was a famous yeah. restaurant in Notting Hill called 192, <laughs> where you obviously yeah. wrote the song. <laughs> That is, that is very funny. I know it is at 192. Yes. <laughs> but, okay, so what was the biggest gig you've done so far as Generation Sex? What was the one that blew your mind and thought, this is it now? I think when we played at, in, in Paris at the Stade de Paris, which is like 70,000 indoors, um, it's huge. And when we were doing um, My Way at the end of the set, literally everyone was on their feet singing along to the track and clapping along to it and it's an extraordinary thing and you see yourself on these massive video screens does money Most, shoot the audience I, at the end yeah, <laughs> yeah, no. that was extraordinary some of the best ones though were in places like the halls at wolverhampton or the apollo in manchester where you're looking at you know three and a half four thousand or something like that where it's more sort of intimate and that was so great because there you could hear everyone singing literally every word of every track. And what are the audience like? Punks, young punks, old punks. Fantastic. Why a, a selection. <laughs> what, what, did, what did Steve think of, uh, of, of Pistol, the TV show? Was he happy with it where it came out? Because it was based on his book, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I, you know, I, I think it was, I said to Danny Boyle when we went, to, when I met him, that I, I, I really enjoyed it. And I thought it, it put across the vibe of the time. Of course, there were in a, certain inaccuracies, and I think it was a bit over cruel to Glenn, which was a bit unfair, but I guess they put that in for the drama of it. Um, and that's always going to happen in someone's personal life. But I thought overall it came across really well and put the feeling in, in an excitement of the time. Oh, you saw Chrissy Hine the other day, didn't you? She and do you know what's really radio. annoying is I forgot to, to ask her about it because uh, oh, right. she features so heavily. Um, yes. No, but do you know what was one of the sweetest things was seeing Chrissy the other day. She said that that she was she could still has this thing from when she was a kid, that she was such a Beatles fan she can still do all of their signatures perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> My God! So someone's probably spent a hundred thousand fortunes, on, fortunes exactly. on Chrissy Hines, George Harrison. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, my. Uh, there's there's a, a, a tape in existence which we've never released of London SS which I will get to at oh, another yes, time. Oh yes, yes, yes. And there's actually a recording. Oh, another time. That yeah. At the front of the tape, someone in the room says, "You realise everything you're saying about Chrissy Hind is going on to tape." So we obviously were friends and hanging out at that time with her. And that sort of opens the recording. Oh, that's of, wonderful. That's a piece of valuable social history, it feels like. It, first time that's, I that's also actually a fantastic opening to an album. <laughs> yes. And the first track we did was Rambling Rose, which, of course, you know, um, the MC5 track, oh. which is sad because obviously he of just course, died. Yeah, he just died, yeah. Yeah. Well, so let's go back to your to your roots. Yes. You know, we have to do this um Yes, because, because I'll try not to interrupt you. I talk too much. We we interrupt. No, you don't. That's all we do. We were going to call this podcast, you know, the interrupters, but <laughs> it, it's what we do. <laughs> don't worry about it, Tony. But okay, what was what was your? Because you're 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 about six years older or something, seven or eight years older than us two. What? Yeah. What was your sort of first thing that turned you on? Well, we I, I grew up in a place called Strawberry Hill, um, which is between Twickenham and Teddington just on the river at Twickenham. And um, my life changed the day we went and saw our first group. And my friend at school said, oh, there's this group called Deep Purple playing around the corner in this club called Eel Pie Island, which obviously is a very famous legendary what? What? club. And um, I would have thought it was gone by those. That time. No, no, no. No, it, re it, oh, it reopened as Colonel Barefoot's Rock Garden. Right. And we were, I was at Hampton Grammar School. 
and I could walk to Eel Island from my house. So on a Friday evening, we walked to Eel Island and I paid my money and queued up. And we and I saw Deep Purple. That was the first sort of rock group I'd how, seen. How old, how old are you here? Must have been 16 or something like oh, that. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, and um, that was the change changed moment of my life. See, I think there's a thing with musicians that when I saw that first group, I, I loved it and I was totally freaked by how loud it was and how exciting it was. But in that moment, I knew it. I wanted to be the person on stage, mm -hmm. not the person being a fan. And that's often the difference that makes people become musicians. You want to do it when you see it. It inspires you to be it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, I never for a second thought we could ever reach the heights of playing in a little club with a real group with real two cabinet amplifiers and high watt stacks and things. Uh, but that was the moment it all started. And, and then the next week, I think we saw Black Sabbath and Free and Taste with Rory Gallagher. And wow. so it was that English blues rock boom which kind of formed my start in uh, in rock and roll. And then, of course, uh, we loved all the English counterculture groups, Hawkwind and the Pink Fairies especially, and the Edgar Broughton Band. We travelled all round to go and see these groups. Where we lived in Strawberry Hill, there was a, a, teach, a, train, a college called St Mary's at the end of my road, literally 100 yards from my front door and um, one of the, the next group that i saw was the pink floyd playing at st mary's college in strawberry hill and what, so, what, and what, what year is this so what, what were the pink floyd doing at this point saucer full of secrets oh my god so, what so we do with david. controls the heart of the sun this is with david not yes david. yeah yeah these were the, all the groups that changed everything it's funny I, it, during the whole punk movement I sort of edited it out in there in my head because there was that <laughs> no Elvis Beatles Rolling Stones yeah. in 1977 kind of catchphrase. It was as if we all edited out the fact that we actually all really liked Elvis, the Beatles, and the Rolling Stones, and they were one of some of the main groups that informed us. Well, but you you actually wrote that that came out in one of the songs. I think it was in Ready Steady no, that Go. Was a, that was a, it was a clash. clash. It was a clash. Well, you said that. No, 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 not that. You're in Ready Steady Go. You 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 well, it actually, actually says I'm in love with those groups. I'm in love so with those groups. I was going to say this is the difference between uh, this is further on because there's something I want to say about how Generation X were different. Yes. To, to the other punk bands, but we're not there yet. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> so I'm going to Oil Pylon, um, seeing groups regularly, you know, following Hawkwind, Pink Fairy, seeing them play under the West Twink. Way. <laughs> loved him in that band. Yeah. And of course, the two drummers thing yeah. was something I really loved. And then I needed to get a bass guitar, buy a bass guitar. Or now, why a bass guitar? Why did you choose bass guitar? I think at school. It was one of those things where someone already played drums. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or played that, guitar. Always the case. It's like, well, I'll I'll get a bass. I was sort of saving up for a f my first cheap bass, and so there was there was a big house at the bottom of our garden. Um, we lived in a kind of a semi-detached row of houses, and at the bottom of the garden was a big house, like a big old Victorian mansion, and I started babysitting this is a funny story for the people who lived in the big house at the bottom of our garden well it turns out the man who owned the big house who i babysitted for was a man called neil aspinall oh who oh was his road manager and I'm, who at that time yeah. ran apple records yeah yeah wow and so when i bought my first amplifier um he let me rehearse in the basement of his big house so i had my equipment so i used to practice it, and it seemed like totally normal and not a big deal. But obviously you look back at it now and you think, fuck. <laughs> so, I, I, I also like the fact that, that Neil Aspinall went to the estate agent and went, have you got anything like strawberry fields that I can live in? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. That's right. So can you imagine there's like a, you know, 15, 16, 17 year old, I'm sitting there at night, um, babysitting, sitting there with a bass guitar on my lap and they bring people back for drinks after their night out. And I'm suddenly I'm sitting on the sofa with George Harrison and Keith Moon. Oh, my God. And they're going, 
Oh, so you want to be in a group too? Well, you know, you should learn the classics. That's what we did. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's but amazing. Then you, you think it's totally normal. Yeah, yeah. And and years later, when um, Billy and I were offered our first management contract, we took. I went. I we didn't. We someone gave us a management contract, and we're going bloody hell. What do we do with this? And I went. Oh, I know this bloke. I bet he knows a bit about it. And we, Billy and I, took the management contract to Apple Records. And we sat in Neil Aspinall's office in Apple with our management contract. And Neil was just in uh, one of those periods where they spent millions and millions of dollars with lawyers fighting, you know, all those deals the Beatles wanted to get out of. And he, he looked at it and he went, don't ever sign this. And we didn't. So maybe he really... Who was dodged. that with? Was that Bernie Rhodes? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, pre-Bernie. Pre <laughs> That's a, you know, then we get on to yeah. the next chapters. So I had a group at, when I was at school that was like a counterculture type group. Um, and it was called Sun, spelled S U U N. And I've, I've actually got tapes of that as well. And we used to, we played that's, gigs. That's now an IKEA bookcase, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <yeah. laughs> we, and we used to rehearse, uh, uh, we used to play gigs at the local squat in um, uh, Twickenham. So they took over this old hotel, and and we put, we actually played at the Windsor Free Festival as well, and we had two drummers, <laughs> bass oh, and fantastic. So it was a sort of proto, a kind of a bit of a Hawkwind Pink Fairies copy. Yeah, so that, yeah. you took that idea onto C Six Sputnik, didn't you? Yes, yeah, later yeah, I yeah, liked yeah, it. Yeah. So yes, yeah, Sputnik was a kind of futuristic version of that. I mean, when I look back at the songs, I, you know, it's pathetic copies of everybody else's stuff, but that was the initial thing. Was it was now, it, were you yeah. sort of when was the moment I'm guessing that you sort of started looking to New York for your inspiration? That came later. I I tell you what happened. It was that the, the, I suppose there were two things when I think about it that had this group, and then we'd started to go a bit further afield because a friend of mine at school had a car, and we would used to go to gigs across London and. You know, technical your technical college and Fulham Greyhound was one of our main oh, places nice. that we used to go to because it was free. And we used to go and see all these groups there. And um that was the next thing that changed because I had this sort of space rock pink fairies counterculture group, but I'd also bought the a book by Nick Farron, Mick Farron, called The Tale of Willie's Rats. I don't know if you know of this no. book. It was about a, a kind of an English proto-punk group who grow up in Labrook Grove. And the other who, thing that... Who is Mick Farron? Was he a musician? He was, he was a, an NME writer, an NME writer. Who had that band, The Social Deviants, back in That's the right. Middle Earth period. With the guys yeah. from the Pink Fairies, pre-Pink yeah. Fairies. And also, the other thing that I'd started to buy was from Compendium Books in Camden High Street. We used to go to Camden High Street and to the market on su Sundays. They they were imported an American magazine called Rock Scene that had all those American groups in, like the New York Dolls. And the New York Dolls were, were the other main group that I started to get into. So like the Ziggy Stardust and the Dolls came along and it's like, wow, this is like exotic looking, yeah, yeah, young, yeah. arrogant Rolling Stones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, those were the things that were starting to go, oh, there could be something different than the kind of counterculture labral growth scene. So, and then I, uh, a, heavy, uh, a heavy metal kids gig at Fulham Greyhound. Ah, with Gary... Gary Holton. Gary Holton, yeah, yeah. Yes. Who was in our Vida Zen pet. But a fantastic yeah. kind of glam, glam yeah, rock yeah. energy. Yeah. Front man, kind of the artful dodger yeah. as yeah. lead Um and I went to the Fulham Greyhound and I met this other guy and he said, oh, I, oh I'm playing in this group um, and uh, we're rehearsing in Southwark. Why didn't you come down and see us? We And we were chatting in the bar and he was also reading The Tale of Willie's Rats at the same time. So we had this kind of connection. So that week I went down to see this group that he was rehearsing with. And when I got there, he was just coming out um, and he said, you're not going to believe this. I'm sacked. They fired me. <laughs> oh my god! Okay, and and we went. Oh, and we sat on the tube on the Baker Loo line back to Maida Vale, the two of us, and we went. Well, maybe we should do something, and that was Mick Jones, and yeah. that's how we met. 
Mick Jones, he wasn't other... bald then. No. <laughs> no, that's right. Yeah, being <laughs> wavy long, head, didn't he? And he played like hair. an explorer guitar or something. Yeah, and he, had, he looked yeah. like a kind of a, an English Johnny Thunders. Yeah. Because yes. the other person was at that, was at that heavy metal kit, kids gig that I didn't meet was Steve Jones because he was going to the Fulham Greyhound at the same time as we oh. were. So right. all these people were kind of gravitating, even though we didn't know that destiny was going to bring us. Also, all wasn't there that there's a t-shirt involved, isn't there? There's a um, the, the one day you're going to wake up and know what side of the bed you're on. So, was that later? yeah? So Mick and I are talking about forming a group together. We have long hair. We look like a, a UK New York Dolls at this stage, and we start running adverts in the Melody Maker saying wanted young singer, young young guitarist, because we thought Mick would just be the rhythm guitarist. We didn't think, he didn't think, you know, whether he would be good enough to play lead guitar. Um, and we started advertising wanted into New York Dolls, Mott the Hoop, or Small Faces, the, the yeah. kind of classic things that you would expect. Yeah. Must be skinny. It's <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. I love that. <laughs> uh, in fact, I've got all the adverts that we ran in the Melody Maker torn out of the Melody Maker. Oh, I've brilliant. Got this. No, no beards. No, well, that's that's the general kind of vibe. No breadheads or time wasters. Right. <laughs> so the first, the, the first person um, that replied to our advert was a bloke, uh, and he said, oh, "I'm I'm working in Belgium at the moment, but I'm coming back to the UK." and why don't I come down and you know have a have a play with you guys? And that was Brian James. Ah, yeah, you ended, ended up ended up in the damned. the damned. Yeah. So the the unfortunately titled London SS was three. Then it was Brian yeah. James, me and Mick Jones, and uh, a drummer called Roland Hot, who we'd we'd met at some sort of pub rock gig. But we were looking for drummers at the time. But there's no sense of punk at this time. There, there's no. no. There's no. You don't know. I mean, Malcolm no Ramones. No. no, only New, only New York New Dolls. Dolls. And Iggy, yeah. can I just interrupt with one little point of pride here? So I just say that, you know, my first ever professional gig, when I was, I was probably 18 or just 19, was playing for Sylvain Sylvain. Oh, really? When he came right. Yeah. I went right. to Europe with him and everything. So anyway. Right. Well, and of course, years later, I ended up touring with Johnny Thunders, yeah, of all yeah. people, oh. and Jerry, of playing with the two. But that's further down the... So yeah. good. So good. They named him twice. Uh, I'd read about this shop in the King's Road called Let It Rock. And I'd gone up there on the Saturday afternoon, and the only thing I could afford to buy from the shop was a T-shirt, which was the one of these days you're going to wake up and know what side of the bed you're lying. So this on. is Malcolm and Vivian's shop, right? Yes, yeah. and this T-shirt, according to Bernie, was designed by Bernie, and it was really two two halves on the T-shirt: mm -hmm. the cool side and the non-cool side. But it was very hard to tell which was which. Unless you knew it were in the know. How, do, how could one side be cool and one not? Is one bubble writing or something? <laughs> no, no, no. It was a list of <laughs> artists and groups. Writers. Uh, uh, yeah. and, and writers and things. At uh, first sight, you might think, oh, they're cool as well. But they're sort of not cool or something. Are you saying, Tony, you were the first rock player to wear... Uh, a, a, a McLaren Westwood. I don't know if piece. I was the first one because obviously, unbeknown to us, the nascent Pistols were recursing across town. Right. Okay, and we okay. hadn't met them yet. Oh, okay. this so is beautiful we're stuff. We're doing our thing. And then we went to see Deaf School at the Nashville, which was one of those classic places. You know, I saw ACDC. It's a there. band who don't get the credit they deserve, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Langer yeah. wins. Is it Clive Langer? Or is it or is it Clive Langer? Langer. Yeah, it was Clive Langer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we were we were, were standing watching Deaf School, and I was wearing all proudly my T-shirt. We've got long hair, and this little bloke in a hat and glasses comes up to us wearing the same T-shirt, right? So rather arrogantly, I said to him, "Oi, look." Don't stand next to me in the same T-shirt. It's making me look bad. Here. And he went, what are you fucking... And I designed that T-shirt. What do you know? <laughs> and it was Bernie Rhodes. Yeah. So amazing. we were talking to Bernie, and he, and we said, oh, we've got this, this band called London SS. And he went, really? That's interesting. And that's how we hooked up with Bernie and then became a, a year and a half or two years of Bernie making my life a total misery, <laughs> but also a fantastic... 
This could take longer than an hour if it's I keep right. telling you. You want to hear the whole right. story. Because obviously Mick Jones stayed with Bernie, didn't he? Did it? Did, yes, Mick, that's yeah. right, because he managed the clash. Like, yeah. But Bernie was going to be our manager. So Bernie said, you need a place to rehearse. And he found this place. It was a basement in Prade Street in Paddington. And it was on the corner of, Pr- of Prade Street, Paddington Mews, and a street called ironically star street <laughs> was whether this basement was and bernie set it up that we could rehearse and and he put all his records on the jukebox in the cafe which was above the basement rehearsal and that became our kind of two eyes hanging out place yeah 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 <laughs> so we're doing our thing so we've still got long hair we're looking for a uh, david johansson to front the group and we're putting adverts in the paper, and it's got Bernie's phone number in the adverts from then on. Do any of those songs survive in other bands later? I think Protex Brew that we'd... St- was oh, wow. One, Clash did. Um, so, and, yeah, are they already... Pu- are, are they fast? Are they punk songs then? They're yeah, MC5 speed. Right. Ah, MC5. We were listening to the MC5, that album, Nuggets. We were playing Roadrunner. You know, Jonathan Richmond was trying to filter through. We were doing bits of Dole's tracks, um, bits of fast Mott the Hoople tracks. But the Ramones hadn't come along yet. Remember, the Ramones was the total game changer where when that album came out, all the punk groups doubled speed. That's it, yeah. Um, So that was totally changed everything. So, But we're still doing our sort of New York Dole's thing. And there was at one stage where we, we went over and we went to the Pistols rehearsal rooms in Denmark Street, where they were. And we walked in, and we all had long hair, and they all had short hair. And we sort of went, "Fuck, yeah. they've all got short hair." And suddenly there was this kind of thing where we suddenly felt it was kind of wrong, you know. And we just spent all that time at school standing outside in mass lessons from having long hair <laughs> because you weren't allowed in the classroom. Yeah, yeah. It was, so we it was suddenly we faced with the. What about, about flares? We ne- definitely had flares and all those things. <laughs> so we suddenly were realising that there's something else going on. Who, we whose were. idea do you think it was to get your hair, to get their hair cut short? I'd lo- you know, Steve ever told you I, that? I think probably Malcolm and Bernie's. And then um, we did, we started rehearsing. We started auditioning people in this basement that Bernie had found us. And we put all movie posters on, on the wall, horror of the maniac and all these sort of horror film B-movies. posters. B-movies. Yeah, B movie, cult movies, all round, and um, we needed microphones. And Bernie turned up one day with a load of microphone, all these microphones, and it was like brilliant. They were really expensive microphones, and he went, "Yeah, I, I, I got them off. Um, Steve Jones got them for us." <laughs> and we, and we, <laughs> turns out, where did he get them? Ziggy's last gig. <laughs> <laughs> was it really? Is that true? Yeah. I've always doubted yeah. that because I knew because I thought it was Bob Marley that he stole some stuff from at the well, Rainbow and but... Roxy, Roxy Music. But it was well, Ziggy's. He obviously gig. collected them over time, yeah. and we got them for our rehearsal studio. So now we've got a studio, we've got microphones, bit of a PA, and we start, you know, trying to write songs and auditioning people. Paul Simonon came down to as a singer and did a, a very long, boring version of Roadrunner. I think he might mention it to you. Rats Gabies came down um, to audition as drums, a drummer. You named um, him Rats Gabies, did you? That was your idea. He came down and he had fucking scabies. <laughs> and Bernie was totally freaked out. Bernie spent the entire rehearsals putting newspapers on chairs in case he caught something off him. That night, there was a st- <laughs> bit at one stage, that there, and it was quite a seedy place, there was this giant rat standing behind the drum kit looking out and and we went fuck me rats and scabies four days later we're in the pub in portobello road and he's he walks in with a black t-shirt with a drawing of a little rat on it and he's calling himself rat scabies so that's where that name came so all these different people came through the sort of london ss rehearsal place because you you can imagine the scene is really really tiny at that time There's the pistols across town with their short hair. And we spent a lot of time with Malcolm and Bernie, them telling us what was going to happen and how you could change the music business and how that everything else would look old-fashioned. 
and and reading lists, right? Didn't Bernie give you? Yes, I mean this was an extraordinary thing that Bernie used to make because Bernie's thing was always weird. Because now I now lived in Strawberry Hill in Swickenham, in a more sort of affluent area. Bernie would always say, "You're too fucking middle class, and you go to grammar school. You're too middle class. You need to, you need to get more streetwise." So Bernie would give me reading lists, which I would take to Teddington Library, and I would come back with Jean Paul Sartre books and and, and books on art, and and I dutifully oh, yeah. nothing, read mi- nothing middle class about that. <laughs> no, dutifully read all these books, but what I realised was, of course, it was genius what he did. Because rather than come along and say, this is what you need to sing about, this is what you need to be, he put us in an environment of creativity and the right influences and allowed us to come up with it ourselves. So it was very clever. His classic was One Christmas. He went, he went, what are you doing for Christmas? And I went, well, staying at home with mum and dad. You don't want to do that. You should spend Christmas with hookers. And also, you've got to go out and buy spare rib and gay news in your local news agent. <laughs> did you do that? <laughs> no. Did you spend I, Christmas with hookers? <laughs> no. <laughs> I did chicken out of that bit. But you can see where he was coming from. Uh, another classic was he took us in his, what we used to call the Bernie Mobile. He had this little car. And he took us to um, Hamilton Terrace in Maida Vale. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it was a, a huge mansion and obviously a really extraordinary rock and roll party going on. And we could see people like the Rolling Stones going in. And Bernie said, now, I could take you into that party, but you're not ready. Oh, my and God. And he drove us away. Oh, my God. So th- <laughs> that was Whose the carrot. was it? I have no idea. He was dangling <laughs> that carrot, you know, well, he's saying, of aspiration. Well, he's his catchphrase was, you haven't said one thing that's original. What are you about? And we go, and, and we used to call it the riddle. And he'd say, do you know what you're about yet? And we go, what does he mean? We're a rock band. We just want to write songs. No, but what are you about? Yeah. And that's why he would give us books on art, because those books explain that you would understand that artists, when they're special, are about something who was he inspired by was it lou golden pete meaden was it was it uh... all of those people but remember him and malcolm didn't they go to the um lse um and they went to art college so they came from a very art yeah. background which i knew nothing about but obviously once i'd done bernie's reading lists and i'd been for all the things to the library and read all the things i started to understand what he meant was you need to write songs uh, that other people aren't writing. You need to understand how your group fits into the world. What are, what are you about? Yeah. So, you know, punk rock suddenly was very clear what it was about. Was so, he was he inspiring so, Malcolm, do you think? I think Malcolm and Bernie would both say they totally thought of all the ideas themselves. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's an argument between those well, two. The, yeah, there was a, it became a thing with Bernie, didn't it, trying to kind of... Yes, B, B, Malcolm, sitting, wasn't it? And, yeah. sitting in a, a restaurant with Malcolm and Bernie, and, and Malcolm literally saying, "This is what we're going to do with the pistols, and we're going to do this and this, and it's going to be the biggest thing." And it's like the ghastly story unfolded. So, where does Billy come into this in the beginning of, okay, of your, your, so your next generation, if you like? London SS, it's sort of not really happening. We haven't done a gig. We can't find a singer. I think there was Bernie thinks I'm too middle class to be in a punk rock band or his version of things so that I'm getting a lot of an- antagonism from, from Bernie. We're, and we're all still scanning the adverts in the music papers. And there, there was an advert in the music papers looking for guitarists and bass players that John Cravine, who owned Acme Attractions in the King's Road, right. which was sort of a rival to Malcolm McLaren. Yeah. John Cravine, who Don Letts was the... That's right, yeah. Don Letts was the DJ down there, wasn't he? Was the shop assistant. Shop assistant, yeah. Cravine wanted to put a group together, so he ran adverts. So I, t- I'd, I answered the advert as well and turned up, and Billy also had turned up separately, though I didn't know him then, and also Marco, who went on to play with wow. the admin. Yeah. And it, this was a group they were putting together around... Um, the singer John O'Hara, later to be called Gene October, um, who was the singer of Chelsea. Yeah. And the group was to be called Chelsea. So meanwhile, I'd also answered another advert saying wanted guitarist into 
Small Faces, Beatles, Rolling Stones. And I borrowed my mother's car and driven all the way over to Bromley and to meet uh, a boy who was at university with very ordinary hair and gla little glasses, um, who was to turn out to be Billy Idol. And the two, the two of us got on really well and really liked each other. And also that afternoon we met, a girl came round to see Billy, who later transmuted into Susie Banshee, <laughs> Susie Sue. Love it. Um, so, and I turned up and I said, actually, I can't play guitar. I, I'm, I'm really a bass player. And I just brought my bass there. Meanwhile, I'd bought a Rickenbacker with my first university grant and my babysitting money and was still rehearsing in Neil's basement um, while he played me tapes of Imagine one day. Wow. <laughs> and uh, it's extraordinary when I look back at it, all these They're incredible, amazing, yeah. all these amazing moments. So Billy and I thought, well, maybe we should get together. And I went back uh, a couple of weeks later and we sat sat in his bedroom and we wrote our first song together, which was Ready, Steady, Go. Yeah, I've got it, what? I've got the entry in my diary. It says, went over to Billy's again, wrote a song called Ready, Steady, Go. Cause, Sounds quite Because cool. there's something quite unpunk about those lyrics, isn't, yeah. isn't there? Yes. Well, for a start, the fact that it's looking back. I mean, it's um, because it's because I've got to say what what's. I always thought was different about Generation X because I fucking love Generation X. Was, yeah, was me that, too. <laughs> I mean, I was that bit younger. I was 14 and I thought the whole thing with punk was utter nihilism. That's was uh, the idea that you didn't read any books. You didn't, go yes. to the didn't do anything. It was like everything was rub everything. It was like it was the you end know, of half everything. the truth that was that it was actually incredibly literary. Yeah, so I know. Punk. As turns out, everyone was, was Steve Diggler, everyone you talked to. But Jeff, it would think, it would think, it would think it was a slightly different slightly less nihilistic and slightly more glamorous view of yes. it. It's like you were I, still trying to be something that you aspired to rather than just b yeah. burning everything to the ground. Yeah. And the yeah. fact well, that there's things like Ready, Steady, Go and even a reference to my generation with your generation, you know. Well, I, I guess as well that we were going to university and Billy was at university and Billy was reading philosophy and I'm reading maths. Um, so yeah and if i'd known that i probably wouldn't have left school at 16. <laughs> <laughs> ruined <Yeah>. my life <laughs> well because it was great because in those days they gave you a grant when you went they well, gave yeah. you money to go so i bought my rickenbacker with my first grant and i bought a 4b12 and a, a amp top with my second grant <laughs> so i mean there's loads of other stuff like but I'm, what's I'm interesting giving... is that the ready steady go gets written before the Ramones album, am I guessing before punk? Uh, no, it's got to be post Ramones album. It's got that have, speed. I think isn't we it? must have heard the Ramones, and, by and then. it mentions Kathy oh. McGowan. I mean, yeah. was you yeah. list watching Kathy? I, I, I'm too young for Ready Steady Go. I guess yes, you're. Same were, were you and Billy, or were you, was that real in your yeah, life? Yeah, because we'd watched Ready Steady Go on the television when we used to come home on right, a Friday right. night. So it was important to really... you. It was nostalgic for you as well. Yeah. Well, it's also the, yeah. the, the fact that you're saying you love something, whereas the whole thing would have been just I hate Top of the Pops. <laughs> No, oh, that's right. It was meant to be a positive thing. Yeah. But we weren't that aware of all, all the other groups. So anyway, Billy and I end up being in Chelsea, Billy playing guitar and me playing bass and a guy called John Tao brought in, in as the drummer and Gene October as the singer. And we played two or three gigs around the Chelsea. We played at the Chelsea Potter was our sort of local pub, oh, in yeah, yeah. which was a few doors down from Acme Attractions. And so we played in the Chelsea Potter and we had this other guitarist that, and, and the entry in my diary says, we've got to get rid of the other guitarist, which we did. Obviously really, you know, you're so cruel when you're young. You don't think of, he's probably really, yeah. this is a big moment. I mean, who was that? We, was probably Keith Levine or someone really important. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So then we did gigs with Chelsea, and we played at, at um, we played at the at uh, the ICA on that. I think it was called the Exhibition or something with the people that turned out to be Throbbing Gristle later on. Meanwhile, then Chelsea is rehearsing in John Cravine's office, which is in Portobello Road. So Billy and I are playing with things, but it turns out Billy and I are writing the songs and not. With Gene October, he's not writing the lyrics to the songs. So is Gene, no. Gene gets pissed off. Only less articulate than I might have written it. I think Gene, <laughs> Gene, Gene gets Gene gets pissed pissed off and wants to leave. Is that what happens? No. What happens is we're playing gigs and we played at the ICA and I, you know there are photos of Billy on guitar and Gene singing. It's sort of going okay, but we play at the Nashville of all places. Yeah, yeah. 
And um, what's extraordinary is I have a tape of this gig. We do, we're do we doing songs mainly by my, me and Billy. And that afternoon, we'd written a new song called Prove It, which is on the first Gen X album. And um, we came on to do the encore. And the gall of it, we went to Gene October. Um, actually, we're going to go on and s- Billy's going to sing this one. So why don't you not come on for the moment? And let us do this new song with Billy singing. So we came on and did the track with Billy singing, and wow. and that's when Billy and I decided to to say it's not working with Gene. Yeah, you know, good that he is, and he does you know really good stuff and everything. But it's not for us because we're writing the songs. And also, and actually, Billy was more glam. Billy, Billy yeah. should be the thing. And the we'll the take... pistols are still going are going now, aren't they? Do you know about that? Are going, Clash are going. Yeah, we, yeah, the Ramones yeah. are going. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is, it's in my diary, it's it's either the winter of 76 or the winter of 75. Because isn't there, so there's, we, there's the Ramones gig at the Roundhouse, isn't there? Which we all go to. Yeah. That, that's and an everyone, absolute, yeah. And everyone who's in any punk group was at that gig. We need a lead guitarist because Billy's going to be the singer. And we're back to that thing. Where the fuck are we going to find a guitarist who's going to be right for the group? But, you know, somehow when there's... The planets aligned and it's meant to be. It happens. So a week into us looking for a guitarist or thinking about who the hell could we get, Billy goes to a party in Fulham and there's this little schoolboy group playing and the guitarist is Durwood. And Billy phones me from the call box and I've got it in my diary that says Billy phones up. Billy goes, all excited. I've seen the bloke. He's going to be great. He's got long hair. He'll have to cut it, but he plays great. And Durwood literally came down to rehearsals a week later. And within two weeks, we were playing gigs with Durwood as the lead guitarist. And Durwood's 17 at that t- time, isn't he? He's like 16 and 17. Oh, wow. And he cuts his hair the night before we play our first gig. And he looks like a perfectly young Jeff Beck. He was a great player too. He is a great player. Did, yeah. did, 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 where did you have the name Generation X at that point? Or you... We got that from in Billy's bookcase at home. And we were, so I was rummaging through the books and I, he had the book Generation X and I pulled it out. There it is. Went, is it that one? Oh, well, yes, that's the one. That's the and one. Then, so you must have been, um, I remember years they've been shocked Eight, going into Book Soup now and going, oh, wow, have they reissued it or something? And buying right. Generation <laughs> X by Douglas Copeland. Yeah. Oh, yes. No, which that then out. ends up being the uh, entire name America. of a generation. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. And, Something and so different. Generation X has been completely usurped. And but but, but yeah. that is the, yeah. that is that early book, isn't it? That was That's right. that, that was it a social all... political book uh, by Charles oh, Hamblet oh. and Jane Deverson. I, I love yeah. this bit. Let me read this guy. So it's got what's behind the rebellious anger of Britain's untamed youth, Generation X. Here, in their own words, is how they really feel about drugs, drink, God, sex, class, colour, and kicks. And then on the black, it's got a quote. <laughs> I feel right proud of myself when I can bash someone in. (laughs) Tony James, I read loads of books and go to university. At the end of Youth, 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 (laughs) on the recording, you can hear us quoting that quote. Oh, really? I thought we could bash someone in at the end of the track on the record. So Generation Generation X and that is is boomers, right? Yes, we were a much more positive thing. We were more like... That we were like Who Live at Leeds, Generation X. It was a really explosive group live because Durba was such a brilliant guitarist. Mm. And then once we got Mark Laffin, who played like Keith Moon, we moved into total Live at Leeds type shows. And that's what we did. And we even covered Led Zeppelin's Rock and Roll when we used to play with So, so Tony, this risky, is... Risky, this, risky, risky. This, this is the bit everyone waits for in the show, obviously, because this is where I come in. To the yeah. <laughs> but no, just basically when I first saw you, that was at the Hope and Anchor and it's sort of December 77, 76, yeah. 76. 76. So is, yeah. how, how early in was that to your career? It must have been really, really early. And yeah. I, me- you, you, I remember you, you, you did a short set with lots of encores. Yes. And then yes. I remember you I saying... I dogs barking. And, and, uh, sorry, that, that you didn't say that from the stage, no. What you said from the stage was, uh, we've run out of songs or something like that. I remember that happening. Yes. I became obsessed with you guys, loved you, and saw you used to go to the place called The Vortex, which used to be the Crackers mm-hmm. Club on, on, yes, on yeah, 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 War, yeah. Wardour yeah. Street. On Wardour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were the first group to play the, the um, Roxy. We played it, I think, on December the 12th or something. There's that great poster of me and Billy that I made up out sort of 
cut ups out from the Evening Standard and we Xeroxed it. Because Roxy was Andy Chazowski. Is it Chazowski? Andy Chazowski. Chiz- yeah. Chazowski, how it pronounces his name. Actually, the person who found the Roxy Club, I have to give him credit, was Gene October. Oh. It was called Shagaramas before and it was a kind of a gay club and he knew of it. And that's how we ended up getting to play at what became the Roxy Club. We supported Chelsea in the early Spandau Ballet called The Makers. Wow. We supported <laughs> Chelsea at the Roxy. Anyway, wow. um, we loved you as our band, The Makers, and we all went to school and we made our own pop art T-shirts to wear in a photograph. That photograph is out there on the internet somewhere. But with, right. we screen printed because we were copying what you were doing. You were wearing these pop art T-shirts. Well, Billy made those very block colour type mm. T-shirts. Mon- yeah. Mondriani did, type things. Yes, right? exactly. And whereas I did the ones that were paintings because i was good at art you know i did a, a an iggy pop one because you couldn't buy an iggy pop t-shirt in those days so i painted my own iggy pop like a from a photograph i transferred the photograph to a t-shirt by painting on the t-shirt you could never wash them and that i wish i still had them my mother gave them to the charity shop when she was clearing out the loft. But, but I'd, I'd like to say that also your your art style, when that first single came out, there was a sense of references of... I think it was the first time I, I'd, I'd seen Russian constructivism inside any pop group's art, which obviously became such a big thing in the early mm. 80s and the Face magazine. Yeah, I would say that. It was. And whose idea was that? Where did that yeah, come? Barney Bubbles did the, um, the sleep. Ah. Uh, I, I th- he came up with the 45 on the front of dub mixes when they had 12-inch right. dub mixes. So I had a T-shirt with 45, and I think he took that 45, but used that quite iconic 45 Generation X, your generation T. I'd like to also thank Tony for one other influence on, on my career, because um, when uh, Wild Youth came out, the B-side was Wild Dub, and I yeah. loved the way you, you know, this is the first time a, a non-black sort of band had done anything like that and broken down the track into dub and it stayed with me that so when we did to cut long story short you know four years three years later or whatever it was funnily enough on the same record label chrysalis i said can we do a dub version of this and we did our first we did a 12 inch single of to cut long story short mix like that and that was really because of you right 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 well because we were so influenced by vivian goldman who we hung out with who took us oh, to right, see all the and of course, punk was very much because of Don Letts, who we were friends with because of Atme Attractions, who was then the DJ at the Roxy Club with Leo. We were listening to, because re- there were no punk records to play. They would play dub reggae. Well, also, you needed something slightly chill to listen to at some point. Yeah. Yeah. So it became a <laughs> massive, massive influence. That record was produced by Phil Wayman. We got Phil Wayman, who was the producer of The Suite, because we liked Ballroom Blitz. And he, he produced our first two or three records. Um, he was totally freaked out the idea of doing a dub version. And I think we en- he sort of ended up doing it with the engineer. And we were going, no, put Echo on this. And can you do that? And can you stop the, you know cutting it all to pieces? It was really kind of experimental because obviously a rock track is really fast. It's hard to get the dub effects to sit mm-hmm. with the rock beat. So you had to half time the drums and everything. But that was a... Um, yeah, a very experimental, but the first of its kind, a rock and roll dub. But there was a sense that you were the you were the pop stars, if you like, of the punk movement, Generation X. You you had you had exactly. pop sensibility. It was a you know, glam rock was definitely your influence. Well, because Billy had changed his hair, because one day he cut, he came in because I knew him as um, as Billy all the time, and then one day in because uh, uh, he still had blonde hair, but just sort of swept over to one side he didn't have the spikes uh, it was only early on in gen x where he he turned out one day and went i'm going to be billy idol and he'd spiked all his hair up and we went wow you know and that's when i first sort of looked at him because i was he always looked quite nerdy when we first met because he had little glasses and he had sort I've of seen the photograph hair, and it was like a sort of phoenix rising and it was like fuck you know this like monster grew out of the nerdy bloke who was at doing philosophy at university well, what's funny, talking about seeing as you are so much about sort of the conceptual side of things and the ideas and everything, and you got Billy Idol and then you were talking about Ratscapers and stuff. Did it never, did you never want to have a name, Tony? A sort of no, a, well, nom, nom, de, nom de guerre. Um, I did flirt with the idea of calling myself Tony Rome in the early days, um, but after the, mo- the movie, 
Isn't it a Frank Sinatra movie? Uh, it's like sort of a caper movie in the south of France. Uh, but it just seems silly, and that's why I just stayed <laughs> with my real name. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, I mean, what was what was the feeling within Generation X? Did you feel that you were you were getting somewhere with this project, or did it feel like you always had your feet slightly in some in, in some mud and being held back? I, I mean, I know you know I love that first album with Mark, that Martin Russian produced. I absolutely kiss me deadly yeah. in all of those which, tracks, yeah. which we recorded over two days in TW Studios in the Fulham Palace Road which was perfect for me because I was living at my grandmother's house who lived just by Fulham football ground, just off the Fulham Palace Road. So I'd sort of, when I left home from Twickenham, I lived with my grandmother. Because the thing is, I feel, always felt that you were slightly ahead of your time, really, that, you know, there, a, lot, a lot of punks were sort of clambering to get on top. You had something that actually would have succeeded more in the 80s. And of course, Billy did succeed in the 80s. Um, yes, well... It was conceptually a great looking group. I always had this kind of thing that everyone had to be the same height and thin and have the right hair and, you know. Yeah, like the Beatles. Madness. I, I always was never sure about the original drummer, even though Rob Tyner and the MC5 had curly hair. I never wanted to have a singer with curly hair, although it worked with Mark Bolan. But um, I had this kind of vision of how the group should look and it sort of gradually came so together. Did when you I look li back, literally fail people the audition on their height? <laughs> <laughs> height, size, trousers, yeah. anything really. It was um, like, it's like a police lineup. No, too short. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that thing of youth, isn't it? That you have this kind of vision of how you want it to be. Yeah. And obviously, I took that to a stage much further, having spent all that time with Malcolm and having been through punk when. You know, we eventually moved on to Zig Zig Sputnik. But Bernie was your teacher, you know, in, in a way. Bernie had taught me so well, and Malcolm, and and the Pistols thing was so brilliantly orchestrated, and the quotes and the playing in obscure clubs, which you did with Spandau when you played on the That's Battleship. Right. We we that. were inspired by I you went, guys, yeah. I went well, and I went to all the first Spandau gigs. You know, I, I went to the one in Birmingham. Didn't you do one in... Uh, yeah, we did. I was surprised to, to, well, for you to tell me that. I mean, that's amazing. I didn't know you'd gone up to the one I in Birmingham. Went to that. Yeah, I did... came up in a coach with people. Oh, you were up with all that, with Chris Sullivan and Christos yeah, and everybody. Yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah. God, how, how easily we forget. The, the conceptual ideas were very much from Malcolm and They Bernie. were, they were. Right. They were. Yeah. Did, you did. Uh, I wanted to just ask you about, because you did Gener uh, Generation X went on Mark's show, didn't you? You did Mark Boland's show. We did, yes, we what, did. What was that like? Boland. What was that like? Great, and he was really sweet, sweet to us. And in fact, he gave Durwood his Les Paul. What? What made him do that? I don't know. And then, then we got banned from Granada TV because Mark Laff stole the drum kit or something. I and Bowie was on that show as well. Oh, it was, was that one. Oh, it's a oh, week. That was the, God, that's a week before Mark dies. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. That was the first time we'd ever seen ourselves. Um, and I can remember all racing back to see it on the television because you had to watch it. And did you talk? Right, so, yeah. Did you talk to David? I think we sort of wafted past his aura. Uh, <laughs> because because it's such a sad show. Because Mark didn't want to. Yeah. You know, Mark uh, asked to play with David on Heroes, and David said no. So Mark gets very drunk off of the wine he'd gifted right, to he David. Falls off the stage, isn't he? Always... Falls that's off the right. stage yeah. at the end, and that's the last he was ever on TV. It's gone to play bass, I think, on that one. So, you know, Generation X was conceptually great. It was so exciting live. I think we we went off the rails a bit on the second album where we it got too grandiose. It was a sort of our reaction against Rama Lama three minute, you know, fast punk songs. I was listening to too much, probably too much live at Leeds or too much Bruce Springsteen. Um looking for different influences and that second album although some of the songs are really good they're it, really good uh, what i really like was it was really like really nice clever riffs on things. yes that's the yeah, thing i liked yeah. yeah well which billy is fantastic at writing mm. so, so did billy do the music yes billy did the music well what well, billy would come in with the initial chords and the tune and i would I, I, and i always came up with the titles and the lyrics i'd i type the lyrics on my mum's old typewriter and give them to billy and he and and then he would put the tune together. So yes, it was it was the other way around that Billy wrote the tunes and I wrote the lyrics. You were you were his B Bernie, uh, Bernie Tor but Tor yes. yes, yes. You actually did write dancing with myself, didn't you? 
Yeah, that, that's right. Because that, well, yeah, that was started off as a Gen X song. That, that's right. And what happened with that song is we're on one of the last tours of the original lineup with Durwood, we, we toured in Japan. And um, it was extraordinary playing Japan, really huge gigs, and people went really bonkers seeing us. And um, we were, were in the nightclub, Billy and I, and and there was the the kids in the nightclub were dancing with their reflections in the mirror. The nightclub was had all mirrors for walls, and we were watching. And I went, look, he's dancing with himself. And I went, you know what, Billy, that would be a great great title for a song, Dancing With Myself. And I went home. And I wrote the first three or four lines on, you know, like on the back of a crisp packet type thing, you know, with the mirror's reflection, I'm dancing with myself. And I gave Billy the first initial few sets of lyrics and, and we didn't think anything out more out of it. And, and we were recording the Generation X third album in um, Olympic Studios in Barnes. And Billy came in really late that morning He'd met some girl, obviously, which he did every night. Um, and he went, yeah, Tone, you know that dance myself? I think I've got a bit of a tune for it. And we went and sat on the back, back stairs, Olympic Studios, with an acoustic guitar, just me and Billy. And he sang the E-A-B-A, -A, you know, oh, 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 I'm dancing with myself. And we literally wrote all the lyrics while we sat on the stairs in that moment. The funny thing is, of course, it's, it always ends up on the, any of those lists of great wanking songs. <laughs> which it wasn't like that at all exactly. <laughs> what it does do is that 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 song works brilliantly because it's such positive energy mm -hmm. you, you know you just have to hear the drum beat you feel good and the guitar bit comes on and the guitar bit was very much we wanted Derwood to play with billy and i both love public image leiden's oh, yeah. track you know with a public image da, 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 oh, da, that da, riff. Da, it's one of the great riffs yeah, that's and right. The great so we, bass riffs as well. So, so we said, to do, and of course, my bass on Dance Myself is very like the bass on right. Public Image. And then we said to Durwood, well, play the tune, na, 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 on the guitar, high on the strings, just like in the style of Keith Levine. So Amazing. that's how wow. the, we recorded a demo of it that afternoon. And who was managing you at that point? Is this Bill when you had Bill O'Coin? So you got your American Coyne, manager oh who was going to end up managing Billy, right? That's right. Well, it, again, it was my idea, of course, <laughs> that um, we'd got rid of the original managers, um, Stuart Joseph and uh, what was his name? Uh, the journalist um, who managed Generation X for the first few years, but who really, for me, didn't have creative input and, and were also, what it seemed to us, making all the money. When we signed our record deal, they gave me and Billy a fiver each and went, why don't you go and buy something to eat? And off we toddled. Meanwhile, we, we'd got out of the deal. We had to pay a load of money to them to get out of the management contract. And it was John Ingham was the other manager. Oh, right. uh, we paid a load of money, which sat on the unrecoup position of Generation X for about 15 or 20 years. And I had a meeting with Chris Liss, with Chris Wright and Terry Ellis. And I said, why don't we get that bloke who manages KISS? because he understands the television age. And they flew me and Billy out to New York to meet Bill O'Coin. But uh, um, we met Bill O'Coin and I thought, really, really liked him. Yeah. So he started to manage the group. And as soon as he heard Dancing With Myself, he said, that's a hit. And it was his idea to get Keith Forsey to produce the record. Because oh, right. Keith Forsey had been Giorgio drummer. Moroder's drum. Um, the uh, Marauders records. Um, Bill O'Coin thought Dancing Myself was was a huge hit, and um, so we made it with Key Forsey as producer. Wow. M meanwhile, we were trying to find Durwood and Mark Laff had left the band, even though they were brilliant players and we loved it. And they still go, "Oh, we, you never did our songs." And I would still say to them, "Never once did you ever walk in the studio and go, Billy Tone." Listen to this. Fancy doing this song. Never once. You know, I would have really been happy if he, Durr would have been George Harrison and said, I've got this great one, here comes the sun. What about this? We would have fallen on it. So they'd left the band and we were looking for a guitarist. Well, our first choice was Steve New, the mercurial guitarist. Oh, yes. Before, rich kid. Yeah, rich kid, yeah. Who was fantastic. And we did loads of rehearsing with him. And I've got loads of tapes 
with Steve and his his playing was absolutely was brilliant Steve wasn't he amazing brilliant totally out there yeah, but the as, only thing as is, was he was yeah unfortunately and most of the tapes you can hear me going okay let's do dance for myself then Steve and Steve would go how's it go and I go Steve we did it yesterday it's what chord is it yeah. so he totally forgotten um but I got fantastic recordings of Steve and Billy and me playing and and we got Terry Chimes as the the drummer uh, but but what 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 put dancing myself in Billy's hands as opposed to in Generation X's hands in the end? So we recorded it and it it was a great track. We put it out, but it did nothing. Meanwhile, and and I Billy won't be upset about me talking about this because we we've, we've both talked about it honestly as since we've met again now and and become you know good friends again. Billy had become had started going out with one of the girls in Hot Gossip, which was at that time, Hot Gossip were the sort of sexiest thing on television. I was trying to go out with the other one in the group. And um, Billy was going out with her. And Billy had meanwhile started to get into heroin. And that's something that was a huge shock because when we first started with Generation X, Billy was a total vegan. We used to go to gigs and Billy used to bring a little saucepan full of brown rice and brew it up in the dressing room with some vegetables and he wouldn't eat hamburgers or, you know, the the, uh, the greasy stops at uh, the Watford Gap or anything. He'd have his own little thing. Get to the three albums in, Billy starts to do heroin and that totally changes your relationship. Yeah. yeah. Although ironically, by then... I was living with my then girlfriend, Magenta, who was a heroin addict. I didn't know when I first started going out with her. I remember on our first date, um, she put a handbag on the bar and this huge bottle, brown bottle rolled out of her handbag across the, the bar. And I went, bloody hell, what's that? And she went, oh, it's just my methadone. And I didn't even know what methadone was. Um, so Billy was getting into heroin and that really changed our relationship and that we were no longer sort of hanging out together. Yeah. And so it's really why the group split up because, oh, and, and Bill Coyne wanted us to move to America. Um, and I didn't want to go to America. I was, st I was still quite, um, quite scared of the idea of moving to America, whereas Billy was quite proofed from the fear of that. Um, so Billy just moved to America and Bill Coyne was there. And he took the track "Dancing with Myself" and put it on one on his on his records. I didn't even know you couldn't do that. You know, I went into Chrysalis one day and I went, "Oh, you know, we're in the studio ne um, next week." And um, they went, "No, Billy's in America." And I went, "Is he? Oh, fuck! Better come up with something else then." And I can remember walking away from Chrysalis Records in Stratford Place, mm -hmm. thinking, "Bloody hell! Now what am I going to do?" I'm going to have to start all over again. Do you know what, Tony? Uh, I think this this is a perfect EastEnders drum beat yeah. moment. Because I, then, yeah. then we go on to you sitting in the cafe in Mayfair for a couple of That's years. That's right. The whole Sputnik uh, story, yeah, which, yeah. of course, <laughs> the Sputnik story playing with Johnny Thunders. We're going to get yeah. on to this. Can you imagine? I'm in a group with three heroin addicts and my girlfriend's a heroin addict and I never taken heroin and I never have. Um, can you and come so, back? Can you come back and do a part two? Yeah, Tony? Course, like we'll very part, soon. Really. It's an interesting story, obviously. And it's a great Sputnik, story. You're, the you're, Sputnik you're... story is my grand movie. This is this is my apocalypse now. You know, it's the the conceptual idea taken to the nth degree, and it goes all the way to number one. Oh, really? look! For, we're going to look forward to this. Dream guest. Can, can you and can you and Ben make an arrangement uh, with yeah, us, sure. and we'll we'll get you on for a part two. Uh, we might sure. we might even put out as a midweek immediately yeah, after yeah. this one goes out. Who knows? Look, it's lovely to speak to you both. So Tony is the epitome of of, of rock on tours. This is why we have to make a part two out of this. I had no we do idea. Have to make a part two. I mean, it's uh, even that we could have just kept going. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it's great storyteller, fantastic storyteller, and a nice and an interesting, interesting person. And to, to you know, and great success at the end of, of one's career, to the yeah, most success he's ever had. I mean, if there was ever an example of, of you know, never give up on your dreams, kids. He is it.
Uh, great to see you. So we will be catching up with Tony again. I don't know when that episode's going to come out, but it will. And uh, we've also, we're doing some live stuff, aren't we? We're going to be... We- We're going to be at Battersea Power Station on February the 22nd for our Quadrophenia extravaganza, which we cannot wait to do with Phil Daniels and Frank Rodham. And the whole movie. And the whole movie. Just go to thepowerstation.com. You can find, you know, Battersea Power Station. There'll be a website. It'll tell you. Yes. So we'll see you there. It's good night from me. And it's good night from them. Rock on Tours is produced by Gimme Sugar Productions, a Warner Music Group UK.